Cool. Um, shall we get cracking then? Um, so flip classroom, I I trained myself. No, I prepared to do this training last year, but I got sick, unfortunately. And as I was preparing to do it, to, to do the training, uh, present it, I was actually not that clued up on this whole thing yet. And then afterwards, I started using it uh, specifically for creative arts more than anything else because I'm a dramatic arts and a creative arts teacher. And I, I'm i at the point where I'm going, how have I how have I actually survived up until this point without doing this? This is the best thing in the world because we're all supposed to do lesson planning, which is the most boring thing on the planet, doing it in a spreadsheet and this and that. And I found that using this, exactly what we're doing today, flip classroom with Google Slides, it has become my lesson planning. So last year's lessons, I'm literally putting on my Google Classroom and I'm using them as prompts to teach the the lesson of the day. So it has gotten me so excited because it's almost a press and play type of environment you're in. So I hope I can sort of inspire you to maybe use some of it at least. But before we get into how we're going to do it, it is actually important to understand the why. Because it's such a buzz term at the moment, this whole idea of a flipped classroom. You know, it sounds wacky and circusy and everything. But why do we actually do it? So the traditional classroom, I'm assuming most of you were taught in that way and have ended up in your teaching careers um, actually doing it like that. Uh, and now the idea is to start thinking about things in a different way, especially since COVID hit, we were forced into this realm of technology and a lot of us got unnecessary migraines, but a lot of us also got inspired to maybe try different things. So the classroom we have now is this one that you see on the, on the screen. It's the teacher stands in front and the learners sit there waiting to learn. Um, and it's a very teacher-centered environment, quite obviously. And what we want, and what the CAPS actually, what the philosophy wants us to do is to create a learner-centered environment, a sort of a more constructivist-based environment where learners are able to use content and construct their own knowledge from that. You know, the highest, ooh, the blooms, ooh, the blooms that are those highest levels of analyzing and creation and application. And this is what we could do if we use the flipped classroom method. What is it? Basically, what we have now is the teacher teaches and then the learner goes home and they do their homework. Well, they don't do their homework. But with the flipped classroom, the learners go home, they go through the content, they come to class the next day, and that's where they actually do the quote unquote homework. So they go through the content that the teacher would have gone through in class at home at their own pace and they come to class with a sort of a knowledge base and then they come to apply, to consolidate, to understand. So the teacher, the role of the teacher, it, it shifts towards a facilitator of learning. Now, when I heard this the first time, I sort of went, oh man, that's going to make my job so much easier. Yeah, in a way it does. It actually makes it much more interesting. But don't think that it's <laughs> you're going to do less work. It's just a different type of work. I want to say it's, for me, it's actually more uh, stimulating as well because you, you get to know your kids on a, in a different way, on a different level. So... We want to flip this idea of the teacher teaches and the learner learns because there's this, uh, there's this conversation between what is teaching and what is learning and is the one dependent on the other. The funny thing is, teaching is dependent on learning, but learning is not dependent on a teacher. Any one of us can go anywhere and learn something without a teacher. And isn't it then actually our job to train our kids, our learners, our youth of tomorrow, youth of today, future of tomorrow, to be able to teach themselves, to learn, to know how to look for information, what to use, because they are thrown into this world, cell phone in hand, coming, you know, out of the womb, and now what? So they will not be spoon-fed throughout their lives by learn this, do this, but, but, but we need to help them to enter a world where they have to navigate 
just a plethora of, of, of content and information and how do they dissect it and, and identify what they're actually going to use. So this is why it's, it's incredibly exciting for me. So yes, the name of this training session is Google Slides uh, Flipped Classroom, but what we actually want to move towards here is a type of a blended learning approach. So your, your Flipped Classroom in its purest form is you give the content uh, for preparation for the next day, they come to class and you consolidate, you do work with them, you ask questions, whatever, um, you facilitate the learning. But with blended learning, you don't just put that content in their hands and assume that they know it and they know what's going on, because I'll, I'll chat about that in a bit, but you facilitate and consolidate actively in class. You use technology in class as well. And with Google Slides, you can literally use the same ish, I'll get to the ish in a bit, the same ish presentation that you have created. You need to adapt it a little bit, but I'll, I'll explain that uh, as we get there. So basically what you have is the conventional way of teaching meets uh, technology. And then we get this blended, incredibly exciting approach where learners <clears throat> who are so, ugh, they are so overwhelmed by um, information that's given in such an, it's, it's all interesting visual ways and audit, auditive, audio, uh, what you hear, ways. And we need to compete with that because why on earth would they listen to a boring math lesson if they can go on TikTok and watch a 10 second video on someone's dog or whatever. So we need to be able to actually sort of, in a way, compete with that and make our content interesting. And dare I say, entertaining as well. So why do we use Google Slides? Okay, because we can obviously use many other things, but, and it's not just, I'm not getting paid by Google. <laughs> I prefer Google Slides because it's literally like, for me, it's like internet for dummies. <laughs> it's so basic. It's so uh, pure in its presentation. The interface is easy to use. Um, and what we can do with Google Slides, obviously it integrates uh, perfectly with Google Classroom and all the other G Suite apps um but it's it's accessible online so as i said earlier these learners are born into the world with cell phone or mobile device in hand they have more access to mobile devices than they do desktop devices and google slides also allows for i'll get to the publish online in a second it also allows for uh what do you call it a uh, Ugh, optimization of data usage. I know there's another word uh, for that, but basically it comes down to if you go to YouTube and you just watch a video there, it's going to take a certain amount of data. But if you use Google Slides for your content, it compresses it and makes it more data user friendly. I hope that makes sense. So you have this content online then you can publish online as well. And this is where it gets kind of cool. So if you choose the option to publish this presentation that you've created online, it becomes a small little website. <laughs> so it's not a slideshow presentation, it's a website with interactive links and things going to other sites. And this is where we start competing with everything else that these learners are exposed to on a daily basis. So yes, I've told, I was talking about the mobile friendliness and then also with Google Slides, yes, you can add self-navigation to let's say PowerPoint, but Google Slides again, sort of for dummies, you know, it, it, it's, it simplifies everything. So the self-navigation tools, which is essential to the idea of using Google Slides for a flipped classroom approach, that are so simple. And when you get the hang of it, you're gonna feel like a rock star, I promise you. So what we'll look at today, and I'm going to sort of just rush through the theory because I can talk about this a lot, if you probably noticed, um, but I want to just talk about the why and then we'll get to the how because the session is divided into two bits. It's the theory section, but I just want to sort of explain what we need to pay attention to while creating a science presentation. Um, and then we get to the practical bit where I'm going to give you a template. I'm going to share it in the chat and we're going to play along together and work through this template and see what's out there. Because if you get the basics, then you can do, you can actually, you can make magic with the thing. 
Um, Melissa, just checking in. Is everyone still okay and alive and well? Yes, everyone's fine. Um, we have disabled the microphones. That's why they're not um, chatting with you. That's but if 100%. you need somebody to chat to, you can just... Uh, I'll talk to you. Uh, <laughs> okay. For now, I'll just chat to myself. Okay. So we have these two sections of the training today. The, the theory is such a strong academic word, but you know what I mean. And then the practical bit. And in between, we'll just have a quick five-minute break. And I'm going to share the presentation that I'm working, that I'm showing you right now so that you can uh, click through it because you'll see what's going to happen. But first, what we're going to look at, we're going to look at the self-navigating slides. This is this presentation. And I'll see, uh, I'll show you uh, what it's capable of. Then we're going to look at some practical examples with the templates I'm going to, uh, the template I'm going to share with you. Then there's a, a component of self-practice which that we have at the end. We'll stay online for about half an hour because I'll finish monologuing at around five o'clock. And then we'll stay here until half past five and you can play around and ask questions and brag about all the new skills that you got. And then at the end, please do not keep over now. It's um, You do not have to submit it today, but we strongly encourage you to submit the evidence of learning. So what it comes down to is that template that I'm going to share. There are some instructions on it, and I'm sure at the end, Melissa will give you some more information on how to share your, your evidence of learning, and we'll, we can have a look, and I want to give you some feedback on it. And if there's something that you struggle with, maybe I can, you know, um, not be useless and, and help you find a solution to whatever you're struggling with. So, here we have an example of an excellent self-navigation slides uh, presentation. Now, Jakob van Niekert uh, designed this and he put this together. And I think it's it's such a, a good example of it because if you look at it, it's clear, it's clean. It's not this overload of information because I'm sure <laughs> you all have seen those horrible PowerPoint presentations with things flying in and things in different colors and you get a headache from looking at it and too many pictures. And that's exactly what we need to be conscious of and we need to be aware of it as we design our content. Because if the learners are overwhelmed at home with our designs, trust me, they will go to TikTok. I'm an adult and I even do that. So I cannot blame a 15 year old for getting overwhelmed or bored with something that was not thought through and designed well. So on the first slide, you see we have some uh, indication of what these navigational icons are. So that little thingy would always be the index, which this is, this is the index. And then I hope you can actually see my mouse because I'm not sure. Um, and then the little arrow pointing to the right is skip to the next content. So that would be the next slide. And then this up arrow would be to go back to the previous slide. So if I click on design elements, it's going to take me to that part in the presentation. I will read through the slide in a second, but just to show you, if we click on the index again, it's gonna pop right, right back to that. And then if I click on self-navigation, it's going to go to this section. Now, the first time I saw that, I just went, oh man, that's magic. That is so, so cool. And it is, I promise you, not as tricky as you think it is. Right, so let's get back to the theory. So for a slides presentation, and I'm actually just showing you why, it's important to work with indexes. This, just like we have websites in that home button, um, that's always somewhere in a corner, you wanna be able to go back from where you started so you can navigate from there again. Instead of clicking through a bazillion slides, you can just go back and go and look for something specific. So let's say you have, I'm not gonna use math as an example. Let's say you have an English presentation and you're talking about poetry and you have on your index, you have something with metaphors and similes. The next thing is uh, rhyme schemes and the next thing is um, alliteration. Now, you don't want to click through all 30 slides. You want to just maybe go back and just double check what is alliteration. That simplifies it so much. So use indexes. The next one, number two here, less is more. As you can see on, the, on this specific presentation, there's not a bunch of things on here. So what I'm doing in the presentation, I'm just showing you the first slide of every subsection. Because if I click next, 
it's going to show you, it's going to give you more information on everything. But the problem with that is, and I can promise you, you started doing this right now. When I clicked on this and text popped and the text popped up, you started reading it. And what did the learners do? They obviously don't listen to you anymore if you're using this in class, but if they're at home and they have to work through content, you obviously want to give them some more information. So I'm going to go back to the index design elements. And here we are again, easy peasy. So less is more, you want to simplify it. You want to keep a lot of white space. We like white space because it makes the text more legible. And then with graphics, don't use too much, too many graphics, too many things. People get very excited when they five, five images of Shakespeare and they are all five images of Shakespeare in there. It's really not as interesting as you think. So keep it simple, keep it to one image of Shakespeare then, and that's it. So use your graphics wisely so that it adds to your content and that it doesn't actually take away and, and, and draw attention away from what is actually important on it. And then the last thing here is resources. Sorry, just a sip of water. You want to add additional stuff and Google Slides, you have that opportunity. You can add videos, you can add sound, you can add uh, hyperlinks to other websites, you can add assessments, which we'll get to in a bit. But use that that functionality, use other resources because that's where engagement happens. Because otherwise you just have a learner sitting at home and they're just sort of clicking through it and they're just, you know, hunting on. Sorry, that's what my husband always says, you just hunt on. Um, but you want them to engage actively. You want to you want them to enjoy the learning experience because that will keep them going. So when we go back to the index, we're going to go to the self navigation. So you can't just you can't just hoy <laughs> you can't just throw all of your content onto the slides presentation. There needs to be some sort of plan to it. So for me. Yes, I know what content I want in my presentation, but you need to have sort of an idea of how you're going to structure it. So again, let's go back to the English example. If you have similes and metaphors, you know all that content will be under that subheading. It will be in that specific section. And then alliteration will go with that specific section. So you need to organize your content in the way that it makes sense. So step one is to plan. And old-fashioned piece of paper and a pen, Write it down, draw some blocks, have an idea of what you're going to do. You don't necessarily have to stick to it all the way. You know, your plan is going to change like most good plans. And then you start to build it. You add your content to those subheadings. <clears throat> and only at the end, excuse me, <clears throat> only at the end, <clears throat> sorry, I'm still recovering from a bit of a cold. Only at the end do you start linking all of your slides so it becomes this, I'm going to call it a magic show becomes this interactive thing where you have an index and uh, all of these pages that jump to other things. Because if you start linking it at the beginning and you change your mind, it's going to be such a schlep to go back and change everything. So let's go back to the index. Our third little thing here. You cannot expect, I want to say learner, but any human being <laughs> to go home, work through content, come back to class and you know you, you, you can't really trust them to just know what's going on you have to sort of you have to assess whether they understood what was happening and what is going on in the content that doesn't mean you have to write a test uh, as we all know we can use formative assessments we can have class discussions and you are, you can have something that they write on and then you go home with your red pen and you know you 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 spend your evening doing that instead of watching netflix but with online assessment, you have self-marking options. And seeing as you're here in this training, a summit training, which means it's sort of a, a more advanced level of training, uh, we could assume that you know a little bit about Google Forms and about uh, um, maybe quizzes, quizzes and Kahoot and all of those things, things that mark themselves. And then when the learner comes into class, you can already see, you don't have to go home and mark anything. You can see if they understand something just by asking three simple questions or whatever it might be. So do not forget the importance of assessment in any which way, shape or form. And the last thing I want to just look at here is the adaptation to a classroom. 
So what you have essentially is when you use a flipped classroom, you're going to create a presentation that the learner can go and work through at their own uh, pace, at their own time, you know, after all of the hockey and uh, choir practices and whatever it might be, and they can work through it. So there needs to be more content in that presentation. But if you use that same presentation in class, it's going to be way too much. They're going to end up reading whatever is on your TV. So you want to condense it a little bit more. So as I've said, this presentation I'm using, it has more information in it. But all I'm doing is I'm showing you the basics of it. So if, let's say, um, you went home and you had to go and work through this, if you clicked on this, make a copy, it would give you more information on when and why do I need to make a copy. But seeing as I'm, I'm talking through it and I'm explaining it, it's not necessary for you to actually be able to see that while I'm talking about it. So it's, it's, it's not like you have to go and create a whole new presentation. You just simplify the one that you have. So you have two copies. You have one for, for flipped classroom where they go home. And the other one is that you use in class. So what I want to do now is just quickly share this presentation with you in the chat. So I don't really know what my presentation is going to be about, but let's say it's going to be vocal skills. Something I know a little bit about, so that's fine. Doesn't mean the rest of the presentation is going to be about that, but we'll make it up as we go along. So in the first, uh, the first little instruction says, replace this title with your name. Okay. I still have to get used to my new surname because I was I got married a month ago. So let me see if I remember what it is. Here we go. Very weird to see that. So again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of assuming that you know the basics of Google Slides. But if you do have a question, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm not going to go into the whole functionality of Google Slides, you know, fonts and fonts families and colors and everything because it's it's, um, it's something you can probably go and recap by yourself. So there is my name now as the title. And now we want to apply a theme because this white is incredibly boring to look at. I mean, I'm falling as I'm speaking here. So let's try and find a, a theme that could be a little bit better to look at. For now, I just want us to use a theme that's actually in Google Slides. Because later on, I'll show you how to or where to go and find a theme that is a little bit more interesting to look at. But it's difficult if you import, not difficult, it's a bit more challenging. There we go. It's a bit more challenging if you import and impose a theme outside of slides onto a template that you already have. So my suggestion is if you grab a template from an external source, just work from scratch. So don't, don't apply it onto something else. Okay, so make sure that nothing is selected because if that is selected, you won't have the option to choose a theme over there. So just sort of uh, select a blank space and then you have theme. <clears throat> so over here, you have the option to import a theme, but we're not going to use that now. And I'm going to use this one because I've used it before. And that theme is going to import over the whole presentation. Yes, you can also manually create your own theme, but again, I'm not going to go into that because it's a bit time consuming for now. It's just to show you that the theme of the whole template has now changed. So the idea is as I work through this, play around with your own template, just don't close uh, uh, teams, otherwise you're not gonna hear my voice anymore and that's gonna hurt my ego. So just make sure that you flip between your two tabs. Now, this is... <laughs> I'm saying this every time where it gets fun, but all these things are so much fun. Your Bitmoji. The first time I saw Bitmoji, I was oh, I was cringing so much, but I've become addicted to the idea of you using Bitmoji to personalize your slides because ultimately you want a human being behind whatever is happening on a screen, right? Otherwise it just feels like AI taking over the world. So. Using a Bitmoji, yeah, you can probably use a picture, but that might become a little bit too vain and narcissistic. So a Bitmoji is a bit different. Um, if you haven't already installed Bitmoji, uh, you can click this link 
and it'll take you to the Chrome store. We can uh, uh, you can install it, and I think I might be mistaken, but when I did it, when I set up my uh, Bitmoji, I had to do it on my phone. So you download the app, and you create this whole little avatar of yourself, and then as a plugin on Chrome. You can use it in a whole array of things. So you can use it in slides, in docs, in emails even. Um, and it gives you so many different options. So if I want to insert a, a Bitmoji onto the Google Slides, I up here I have all of the plugins. Yours will definitely look different depending on what plugins you have installed. So the extensions, all of them are actually there. I've just pinned the Bitmoji to my my tray at the top. So if I open that, it's going to give me all the options for Bitmoji. Let's say I want to use this one. And you basically, you click and you drag and you drop it onto your slides. As easy as that. And there it is a little bit more personalized than just a blank, um, blank screen. So something, this seems a bit iffy, uh, a bit finicky, but the fact is if you do this, to try and stretch your image to, uh, to suit your needs because there is now a rectangular blank space. Please, please just don't. Please stop. Please stop doing that. Um, please keep it to its correct ratio. You see that diagonal line on my screen now that shows me that that is now the correct ratio. So you can resize it by grabbing in the corner and then it will resize according to that ratio and it will still look like my Bitmoji, not a flattened or a thinner version. So, everyone's still fine. Can I go on to the next page? I think also one of the cool things about Bitmoji is you can find the Bitmoji to suit literally anything. Literally. So if it's Christmas or Easter or Eid or um, anything, Yes, so able to find something. You can change your clothes. You can do whatever you want to do. So, I I love Bitmoji. It's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And so here I've searched for now Christmas. The stretching of the picture. Yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> oh, we've been there. We've looked at it and we've gotten the migraines. Exactly. So here, let's say it's Christmas, and where are we now? May. So if you want a little Christmas theme, you just type in. You search something there. You go happy. Um, Sad, uh-uh, that is not a word. Sad, and it's gonna give you all sorts of options. So you don't have to go and manually just scroll through everything, but okay, I wanna add this one too, just because it's one of those days. Come on, it's freezing now. It doesn't want me to do it. It's gonna make me even sadder. So let's go on to the next one. So on our next slide, we have some more instructions that we can follow. And ideally, this is where your index is going to be, right at the beginning. But as I mentioned during the, the, the why explanation of this training, we don't really want to link everything at the beginning. You want to create your content, you want to structure it, and then start linking. Um, and I've made the mistake before to link my things at the beginning and I probably spent two extra hours fixing everything after I decided that my structure was not uh, effective because then, then I ended up changing a lot of things and then I had to relink everything. So for now and for this training session, I am going to link it at the beginning. I'm going to link it now, but as a suggestion, just keep it until the last, that's sort of your last step. So a very basic form of linking is to just highlight your text. So let's say item one, we want to link to the first page. So that would be slide three. I don't know if you can see that it's actually called page one. Uh, this is page two and page three. So item one, we wanted to link to page one. So you highlight it and then you right click. Right click, it's going to give you a link option. So yes, here you can link it to an external source. Let's say you want to link it to a Wikipedia or a video or whatever, and it's going to take you to that external source. But what makes self-navigation slides so lacquer and so much fun is you link it internally to another slide. And that's where you get this thing where you click on the index, it goes to the index. If you click on a page number, it goes to the page number. So item one will be uh, page one. So for that, as I said, you highlight, you right click, 
uh, go to link and say slides in this presentation. And then we want it to go to page one. So that's going to be slide three, page one. You click on that. There we go. Now, if you see that it's underlined, it's going to take you to page one when you click on it. When you highlight this one, same thing, right click, link. And now what, oh, this is the one thing that annoys me. You can see that I can't actually go to the bottom of this thing because for some reason, this little drop down extends beyond the border. So all you do is maybe just, oh, no, I can't move this thing. Um, I'm going to just move this whole thing. Don't worry about what I'm doing now. I just want you to see the drop down. Think. So that's the annoying thing for some reason. I hope they fix it soon. But it when the drop down comes and your item that you want to link is too low on your slide, it's going to cut it off, unfortunately. So slides in this presentation, we're going to link this to page two. And this one, we're going to link to... It's probably going to be slide four, I think. Slide five, there we go, page three. And then this last one, we're going to go to the assessment. So it's also cool if you say link and, oh my goodness, it's cutting off again. Let's move the box. As you can see, that this has been a point of endless frustration for me that it just cuts off. But we move, we make a plan. Oh my goodness, okay. I'm trying my luck here. So you can also search for a slide. So if you know what your what your slide's called, you can search for it. And now it doesn't want me to. There we go. So slide six is going to be the assessment slide. Let me just move this. Oh goodness. I'm working on a Chromebook, which is very sensitive to the touch, apparently. So I move that back. And there we go. Everything is now linked to another slide. So no matter what you do, you can insert five other slides between this, between these two slides. And this thing, this item that's linked will still go to page one because you have now linked it. It's not linked to the next slide. It is linked to a very specific slide. But for you to get, let me just highlight this again, for you to see the slide names. So if you want to go to your slides, if you want to see page one, if you want to see the slides name, this is not something important. And you add extra slides to your presentation. Don't just click the plus. Yes, you can do that. And it's going to give you a blank presentation. But this is not really an optimal way to go about it. I just want to delete this guy. Click on that little drop down next to the plus. And then it opens this tray where you can choose something that says title and blah, blah, or title or whatever. Choose something with a title because Google Slides will pick up the title name and that makes it easier to search in that little drop down when you're look looking for the slides to link it with. And now this might sound a little bit confusing, but as you go through it, it would make more sense as you practice it. So the next thing, sorry, water. The next thing, oh, this is fun, is flat icon. So again, if you don't have flat icon, you can just click this, clink, click this link <laughs> over here, and it's going to take you to Chrome, the Chrome store, I think, um, and you can install it. I ob obviously already have it installed. So when it is installed, you are going to open up this one, add-ons. Now, unfortunately, the name of flat icon does not appear as flat icon. It appears as icons for slides and docs. So once you have it installed, the name is going to be icons for slides and docs, and you say start. And it is the free version of this plugin, this add-on is perfect. You do not have to pay for this unless you want to be like super extra, but mm -mm, you really do not have to. All of these little things are free. Unless, let me just see if I have an example here. Okay, let me just look for something first and I'll show you an example of something that's not free. Um, let's look for arrow. You can search for something specific because now I want to start adding the navigation icon. So I'm looking for arrows and I'm looking for something that looks like an index. So first I'm going to search for the arrow and it's going to give me some options. 
all whole bunch of different arrows. So something that is an example of, why am I not seeing an example? Why is it giving me free stuff now? Anyway, it will have a little sort of a crown or something underneath the icon and then it's a paid version of it, but you'll see all the free stuff. It's good enough. It is in fact better than good enough. It's great. So I want an arrow that I use for the back button and the next button. So if I, let's say I'm going to go for, uh, and now I can't decide too many choices. Let's say I'm going to go for that one. Nice and colorful. <laughs> has a smiley in it. Okay, cute. You can choose your sizing, obviously, of the arrow, and that sizing will also affect the data usage at the end. I'm not going to use the biggest arrow because that's not my, same, my, my main feature of the slide. So I can use a smaller one, like a 64 pixel one. And I can also, if you choose a black arrow or something like that, you can choose the color. Obviously, this one is colored already. It's a turquoise -y thing. And I'm just going to click insert and it's going to it into my slides presentation <clears throat> in a minute. There we go. There it is. And as you can see, the background is transparent. So yes, you can go and search for images on Google of an arrow, but even though it says it's a PNG with a transparent background, it's lying to you most of the time. This thing is transparent. So you can put it over something and you can still see the background. So, Let's go for, that is my next button. And now I want to go and find a before button. So what's cool is when you choose, a, a, I almost say the sticker, a flat icon from a certain pack, I call this a, a pack, uh, it gives you all the other options in the pack. So you can actually have the same style of button if you want to. And obviously with my luck, like, I'm not finding something that looks like a back arrow. So let's go to a different pack. Um, I'll just search arrow again. Um, no, I'm going to go for that arrow. As I said, you can actually choose the color of the arrow. Let's go for a purple one. That's wacky enough. I say insert and it's going to do the same thing. It's going to do just chuck it in there. I can move it around. I can obviously resize it too if I want to. But let's keep it that size. So that's going to be the back button. And now we want something that sort of looks like an index. So go home, index. You want to use something. Mm, um, why is it not giving me an index? Uh, menu. You want to use something that's recognizable. So not something that's completely bizarre and someone hasn't seen. So everyone knows this thing is sort of like an index or a menu. So I think that's a logical choice to make. Whereas if you use a monkey face for an index, that's you can't really assume it's an index thing. It's, it's a bit random. So try and sort of um, standardize your, your icons that you use. And I actually end up using the same icons in all of my presentations because then their eyes catch it faster and you don't have to retrain them to identify a certain uh, icon or certain instruction. So there's the last one. Boom. Now we know it's a back button and a next button and an index button. But now I want to actually link these things to other slides. I'm just literally, I'm pressing control and selecting all of them because the moment you, you, you do the drag thing and you do that, it's going to select the outer box and I don't want it to do that. So I'm just pressing control and selecting all of them. And I'm going to press control C, control V, and it's going to give me a copy. And you'll see why. Hello? We have live? Does anyone have a question? No, okay. Everyone's still alive and happy? 
Um, yes, there. No one has a question yet. Ah, okay, cool. Um, nobody is saying anything. I'm not sure if they're lost, if they're with you, if they are eagerly preparing. Maybe I've managed to. In here. I'm not sure. This is Rhoda. Do you want to tell us something about what you're experiencing right now? Confusion, <laughs> excitement. Maybe I've <laughs> managed to kill people at last by my teaching. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so you can just continue. Okay, cool. So if I I want to cut this now and just put it onto the next page because obviously I don't want to duplicate. This means nothing now on this page. I'm going to cut it. So now um, just doing this again. Control C, uh, Control and then select. I'm going to cut it and paste it onto the next page. Boom. Just want to move it out of the way. And now for me to use these as navigational icons. For me, it makes sense to place them at the bottom somewhere, and I usually place them to the right because apparently on the mobile, because this is where your learners are most likely going to use this, on mobile devices, to the left-hand corner at the bottom, um, there's something that pops up which restricts the usage of any icons. I don't really know because I haven't looked at the mobile version. So just as a suggestion, maybe always use the top right or top ugh, or bottom right, and that's sort of a logical thing. And also this thing that just happened is really quite annoying. So if you have a text box, just reshape it to the size of the text that you're actually using. Because if you have it there, that is unnecessarily big. And now I can't drag and do that select of the three little icons because it's going to select the box as well. And then when you move it, it moves everything. And that's very annoying. So if you reshape your text box, to just actually fit the text, you can now drag and you can select your objects just like that, which is actually quite, um, uh, what do you call it, convenient. So I wanna go to add-ons and the icons for slides and docs. Remember that's the flat icon one. It's gonna start it up. And I'm talking about breathing. So maybe I want something with a mouth. And it gives me a whole bunch of options for a mouth. Ooh, that one's lacquer. So insert. And there you go. Again, it's use it's it's simplifying your layout, your design, and not putting a whole bunch of things on there because yes, you can go and you can put a picture of a mouth behind your text, but is that going to add to your presentation or is it actually going to distract from what is important? Because obviously if I want my learners to know about intercostale diaphragmale asemaling, I want them to know to read this content and not look at the big disgusting mouth behind the text. But what's also cool about flat icon, just like pretty much any other object that you insert, is you can also hyperlink these things to other things. So if I write, if I click on it, and I use this hyperlink thing, I can insert a video or a website link or whatever to an external source and it will give them some additional information if it's something that also needs a bit more um, definition and explanation. So that is it, I think, for that add-on. So the flat icon is an add-on obviously, but we can also use another add-on called uh, Unsplash. Now, Unsplash, I've not really used it that much because I find that if I just go to insert image, search the web, I get some more pictures. But just to show you for the sake of it, it it's you go to add-ons, Unsplash images. If you, if you want that, you can go to the Chrome store and you can go and search for Unsplash uh, photo and it'll give you the add-on to install on your Chrome, <clears throat> excuse me, browser. So just like all the other add-ons, it's going to open up this dialog to the right. And here I can search for, oh, let's go for, um, let's just stick with mouth. I don't know what's, what it's gonna turn up. Okay, so let's go for this one. <clears throat> Click on it. 
And as you see, it's now covered my whole slide, so I can use it as a backdrop, but it's also, um, it's covered my text. I can hear someone, someone, questions, no? Okay. I'm just gonna close this dialogue to the right. So if I wanna move this image to the back, because obviously I wanna see my, my text on the slide, you can right click on it and then say order and send to back. And that means your text is going to pop up again because now this image is the, 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 the base layer of your slide and the text is the next layer. So it's the layer that you will actually see. For me, okay, fine. This image doesn't distract too much. But if you go too wacky, again, it's going to distract from what is actually important on the slide. You can also reformat your image. So once you have your image um, selected, you can go for format options and here you can adjust it. Let me just see if it's under this one. So transparency is maybe the one that you want to play around with because that is going to make the image a little bit lighter, which places the focus on the text on the slide. So you can just, See, it still gives you this mood, this atmosphere of, oh, okay, we're talking about breath or mouth or whatever, but it's not as potent as that image. So you can just play with this transparency slider and, and see what makes you happy. The other way of putting in images is, like I said, you just say insert, go to image, search the web. And the thing with Unsplash and this normal sort of Google search for images, all of these are royalty free. Because what we still do, and I'm saying we, meaning I do it, um, you, I go to Google and I search and I use any old image on there. Um, and also, please, as a side note, please never ever use an image that says Shutterstock on it or any other sort of watermark. It's really ugly to look at. We have enough images without that. Please, please. Here you want to insert a video. Obviously, video content, always a popular thing. Um, but video content, unfortunately, it is a big data muncher. So you don't want to have a video necessarily on every single slide. Use it selectively. And I'll also show you how to, it's not cropping a video, but it's being selective about what you want to show in the video. So I'm going to delete this text box so I can insert a video. Very easy. Insert. Video. And it's going to take you to um, either a search for YouTube because Google owns YouTube. So obviously there's a link there, or you can add the URL of a specific video that you know of, of a website. Uh, I'll show you an example now, or you can go to your Google drive if you have videos in there of something. But for now, I'm going to just use a YouTube video. So just going to YouTube, finding something that's vaguely relevant <clears throat> let's go for a theater game <laughs> i'm going to copy the url we all know how to do that i'm sure and i'm going to paste them there click search boom that's exactly the video i want select and it's going to insert it over there so you can resize the video obviously you're not gonna i'm saying obvious sorry it's not obvious. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that's what I want to say. You can't get rid of the black around it. You know, you can put a shape over it, but it's unnecessary to go through all of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but it's really, it's not an issue. It just doesn't look that pretty. It's still the video that you want to show. And the moment you insert a video, this dialog box to the right is going to pop up. And it's going to give you some options on how to, like I said, crop but not crop it's going to allow you to select a certain section of the video if you don't necessarily want to show the whole whole video so let's say i want to start at oh i clicked on a spot there now so i want to say start at use current time so it's on zero zero thirty seven seconds and i want it to end let's say there so we're going to end at 0321, so use current time, oh, so 0241. So that is literally the section of the video that's going to start playing when this slide pops up. 
It's not the whole video, so it's I'm not quite sure if the whole video still loads in the background, but it's not time consuming because sometimes you have a video of a half an hour, but you actually just want to show five minutes of it. So you can select your section of the video that you think is applicable to that specific content. And that's it. Or you can, if it's just a visual thing, you can mute the audio. Um, because a lot of my content is obviously a visual thing with theater and performance and dance and stuff. So maybe it's just a visual thing that I want to show. And you can just close that dialogue and there is your video. <laughs> Duh. So you want to link something in your slide to some sort of external assessment. Now, the template asks us to be very fancy and use a QR code for that. The thing is, if you send this slides presentation home with your learners and you put a QR code onto your slides presentation and they need to open it, it's going to be well, pretty much impossible for them to, <laughs> to access the QR code with the phone that they're using for the slides thing. So a QR code is great if you use this content in a classroom setup because then you have a whole bunch of kids running to the screen and with their phones. Um, like a scene out of Braveheart, and they quickly access whatever assessment you want them to do with the QR code. So I'm going to show you how to do it, but it's it's more for the classroom environment than anything else. So let's go for this one I have here. This is going to be my assessment, so I'm going to send it. I'm going to copy the link copy and then I have a QR code generator I found this one is lucky because I'm going to sneaky sneaky charge you something I'll just insert it over there this thing is literally called I'll actually paste this into the chat now as well so you have a link to it I, I just bookmark it and use it for whatever so you just enter the UR code code it's going to create a QR code next to it and I can say download uh, let's say I'm just gonna say example and it's going to download as a PNG. That's the one that I use. Download. And here I want to upload it now as an image. So insert image, upload from computer because it's on my hard drive. Exemplar. Okay, well, exemplar. Thank you, typo. So that is now the QR code that leads to the Google form that I had over there. So this is something that I can now use in class, maybe an entry ticket. I love this concept of an entry ticket and an exit ticket. Entry ticket is, you, it's the first thing you do when you come into class is to check what did you understand from the, from the uh, self-navigating slides. Um, and an exit ticket is the thing to say, okay, you are now free to go. Let's check what you remembered from this lesson. <clears throat> so a digital assessment is also a lack of thing to use for the exit ticket. So that's our QR code for the assessment. And now we want to add another link for another form of digital assessment. So let's say this one will actually be the one that they use at home. What I've done in the past is I've literally gone and Googled Kahoot and the logo. And then I use that logo as the link to the Kahoot that they can do at home. So I'm going to show you an example. I'm actually going to copy from this. So this is an example I did for my matrix. So that's the Kahoot logo. And as you see, it's it's linked to a Kahoot quiz. I think it's kind of cool. Instead of using another image thingy, they know the Kahoot logo and they all get very excited. Um, if you want to see Matrix acting like six-year-old, give them a quiz in class. So I'm just going to copy this and use it instead of going and Googling the whole thing again. Now I've copied it, but when you copy something from another presentation, it's going to link it to the same thing. So. Now I just want to remove this link because obviously for this presentation, I want to use another assessment because that has this presentation has nothing to do with the content that I used in the other one. 